Welcome everybody to my presentation about wireless troubleshooting, Wi-Fi troubleshooting. Let's start with a short introduction. My name is Rolf Leutert. I'm running a small company in Switzerland dedicated to troubleshooting and training. I'm doing nothing else than working with protocols every day. Um, I'm doing a lot of teaching on customer sites, on all these topics, TCP, wireless, voice, or IP, IPv6. I'm doing this since more than 20 years. Uh, I started with the original sniffer. Who knows the original sniffer, Network General? Okay, a few guys with gray hairs and <laughs> without hairs. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know the story with the sniffer that was the first real analyzer available. My favorite is wireless, really. It's a uh, so demanding technique. We will learn about this and especially troubleshooting, uh, which I do on request for customers. And when I get called, normally it's, it's not an easy case because the easy things are, everything is replaced already. And uh, in many cases, it's a vendor finger pointing. And I will show you trace files from these cases where vendor point to each other and every side claims I did a good job and you're the only one in the world having that problem, right? So uh, this is what I uh, would like to show you here. Before we start, I have a small shark here going around. Uh, on there you will find the trace files if you would like to copy them and you will find two profiles, wireless profiles which uh, will help you in analyzing the trace files. Uh, analyzing trace files of Wireshark will be the focus of the next session right after the break. So I pass this uh, stick around. I can only give you guarantee for no virus until the first station, so <laughs> whatever happens after, <laughs> I'm not responsible. Okay. So let's get started. We have a full-blown program normally this uh, wireless training lasts for three days. Already this shows how complex it could be and it can be understanding wireless. A lot of slides are from my courses, so I picked them out, uh, but I added some especially for this event and uh, updated also the latest technology like AC, Wave 1, Wave 2 and everything, so we will have good overview, but it's really compressed uh, due to the limited uh, time. We will learn that in wireless you have to care about layer one again. This is not a topic in Ethernet anymore. Nobody cares about CRC errors anymore, no collisions. This is all gone with full duplex. And if you have a bad cable or so, don't use Wireshark to find it. Just replace the cable or, or take another port or go to the uh, switch port and look for bad frames. It's not an analyzing issue. You do it uh, very easy. In wireless, it's different. We are back to day one on Ethernet. We have a collision domain. We have a shared media. We have all the problems we had with day one Ethernet, the yellow cable, right? Everybody uh, has to listen before send. And if one station misbehaves, then all the rest of the cell of this channel may be disturbed. So we have to learn about this, and that's why we start at layer one with analyzing. What tools you have to use and can use? You have to need tools here to analyze these layers, and Wireshark is not good enough for layer one, we will find out. It will not be able to tell you what's bad on layer one. It will be able to tell you layer one is bad because too many frames are destroyed. I'm going to show this. But the reason why these frames are destroyed will Wireshark not be able to... Wireshark is a frame tool. Framing is on layer two. 
So we are coming to this later. We will need another tool like the YSPY, which I'm going to demonstrate, or some similar called Spectrum Analyzer. You cannot do this with any built-in adapter. They are not capable of looking at this. We have to learn about different so-called pseudo-headers, radio tap and PPI, per packet header, per packet information header. Uh, they are added. I'm talking about layer two now. They are added by these RP cap adapters, for example, and by other um, cards which support monitor mode, for example, MacBook. And they provide you valuable information about layer one. And you can use this, and we'll show this later, you can use this information to add columns. For example, the strengths of a signal at the arrival point. The strength of a signal varies wherever you are located in the cell related to the sender. And it tells you how strong the signal was, how strong the noise was, was the signal-to-noise ratio good enough or not, and all this information. So. We will use these tabs, uh, this uh, radio tab and PPI header to create column and uh, look for a lot of useful information for troubleshooting. You even can say uh, where you are positioned with your device in relation access point and client. And this is very important, much more important than in the wired area. You may have a very different view if you just move a few meters from A to B, because we have a lot of reflection and a lot of uh, other signal sources. So the position is one very important issue we are going to talk about. Once again, you need to, you need to look at layer one and two, and we'll show you examples from customers where layer one was the problem only. You couldn't do anything on layer two. So let's start with layer one and have a look at what is going to happen there. The thing is with, with wireless, these two bands, 2.4 and 5 gig, they are open for any kind of devices. And it's absolutely legal to have anything there from, from remote control to burglar alarms. Everything is legal as long as the maximum power, which is around 100 milliwatt, depending on the country, is not succeeded. So you have, you have to share these bands with a lot of devices. And there's nothing you can do against it. They are legal. And they are not Wi-Fi. And that's the difference between wireless and Wi-Fi. These devices are wireless, but they don't use any framing. They have just a proprietary modulation, which you don't care, which you don't, which you cannot analyze. But you see energy in the air. And if these devices are working in the channels you would like to use for your Wi-Fi, then you may have interference. It may work, but it may not work, or it may le reduce your performance. And that's what I'm going to show you. So be aware, these bands, especially the 2.4 gig band, there are a lot, hundreds of different devices available even the micro, the famous micro, uh, micro um, wave oven is working in that range. In a five gig, there it's quiet. There are not much devices yet there. Low cost devices, they are, they are all in the 2.4. So if you want to move uh, to a better area, but you know, you invest money, the reach, uh, the attenuation is higher and things like this. So we are going to see this. So we are going to look at layer one with the YSPY, and we, of course, are going to look at layer two with 
wireless, with, uh, Wi-Fi with uh, Wireshark, but also there we may need some additional tools like the Air PCAP in order to see the management and control frames. I show you that you will not see these important frames with the standard wireless adapter in most cases. So that's what we are going to cover during these sessions. Let's start with the Y-Spy. Y-Spy from MetaGeek. Who knows it already? Y-Spy? Okay, quite a few. So that's uh, called low-cost tool. Uh, low-cost or I would say medium cost. It's, it's low cost for an enterprise, but for a private person it's still rather high. It's around $500, $600 or, or more, right? Uh, including software, so it's uh, definitely too high for just uh, private. But comparing to other tools which cost in a few thousands, uh, it's, it's moderate or, or, or low cost. It may not be as precise in regards of the DB scale, but that's not really required as we're going to see in a minute. You, th it's the relation which you're interested in. This device cannot capture any data. It's pure scanner, here it is mounted, it's a pure scanner of the bands. And it scans through the bands and shows you activity and that's what we are going to look at uh, right next. So it will detect every activity in these bands. Whatever device is there, you will see it. And that's the point you may have to look at if you find that the Wi-Fi is not performing. Different signal sources have specific patterns. So Sometimes it's possible out of the patterns to recognize what it is, but here the famous Microsoft, Microsoft microwave oven, it will cover your whole band, 2.4 only. It doesn't go up to 5 gig. Good luck. So, but it covers more or less the 2.4 band. And we are going to talk about this uh, different use here. You see the intensity in, in the different colors. And uh, you may say, OK, micro, microwave ovens are not frequently around in business area, but uh, that's not true. Uh, I have large customers, air, um, hospitals. Uh, they have more than 3,000 access points. And they have a lot of micro, so microwave ovens uh, in, the, in the department from the nurses. The nurses have their room, right? And they do breaks during the day and, and warm up some soup or tea or whatever. So it's not a good idea to place the access point on top of the microwave oven because this is the legal, this is the legal uh, radiation with the closed door. So you, you, the door is closed, of course. Otherwise, you would have 900 watts going out, right? So this is the legal uh, remaining uh, radiation which goes out. And it's really hard, we tested it, it's really hard uh, at the same time uh, to have a reasonable throughput uh, in, 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 that, in that band. So let's look at li uh, some real life uh, samples here. The nice thing with this tool is you can record, sorry, you can record and replay and to start with, I just did a live recording here. So this is live in this room. So you see more or less channel 6 is used here. That's obviously the main channel. You also nicely see here, maybe for the first time, the so-called channel width. So when we're talking about channel 6, that's only the center frequency. And you know that the width of a channel is 20 or 22, depending on the standard, megahertz. It's called spread spectrum. That's the term for it. So that's why 
uh, it was realized at the very beginning of wireless that you could not use the 11 channels uh, separately. Actually, you can only use three uh, beside each other. Uh, that was not clear from the very beginning. So here you see one channel and the nice view you see here, you see the activity in signal strength. So you see here the dBm's, uh, dB milliwatts, uh, and you see down here, you see what's called waterfall. Uh, statistic, you see how busy the air is so-called duty cycle, the relation between signal on and signal off. So this is not too bad, it looks quite busy, but if you look down here, green means it's an activity between uh, 60 and 80 percent. If it's going turning red, then it's uh, 100 and more, uh, 80, 80 to 100. Uh, so actually you still could work here, but it looks like it's uh, everything concentrated on here. So obviously there is no access point available in 1 and there is no in 11 or 13. So if you place, if you would place an access point here, then you would obviously use one of uh, these uh, channels. The signal to noise ratio, that's one important thing, is the distance between the signal and the noise. The noise is what you have down here. It's normally around minus 90, hopefully. And the usable signal must be 20 uh, to 23 dB higher. So if you have a noise signal of 90, then uh, signal strength of 70 is still good enough because you need 20 dB in difference. If the noise, go, noise goes up for whatever reason to 80, then you should have 60 as a minimum. So that's a thumb of rule, about 20 dB uh, signal to noise ratio uh, is good. So here you see some noise, whatever it is, it may be an access point from a remote uh, distant area which leaks into here but it's absolutely no problem because it's still below 90 and uh, the signal strengths here uh, are normally uh, then uh, near uh, 60. What you see here, the blue lines, these are actually activity. For example, Bluetooth probably that's why the line are blue, <laughs> this Bluetooth is jumping in this area. So I have a Bluetooth mouse here, that's probably my own mouse, and Bluetooth has the characteristic to jump, it's called frequency hopping, jump around in the same area. So that's what you see here, probably as these spikes here. But it may interfere with your uh, channel here, but we will see that doesn't matter. Uh, we see that when we look at the transmission on layer 2, we are prepared for destroyed packet. We are recognizing it by a missing acknowledge and we are retransmitting every packet. We will see this uh, when we talk about uh, layer 2. So let's move the band to 5 gig. And in 5 gig, they didn't make the same mistake. They didn't number the channels uh, ones which are not usable. Though you're not talking about channels 60, uh, 37 and 38 and 39, because they are not usable. Again, they would overlap. So when we're talking about channels in the 5 gig, we are talking about full usable channels in 20 meg. So 36 is a channel but actually it starts at 34 and goes up to 38 and the same here. So you see little activity up here, obviously uh, an access point seems to be installed at 108, 108 and it seems to use two channel, that's called channel bonding, uh, that's obviously here uh, nice to see and uh, 
that's also quite visible that we don't have any uh, disturbances here. So again, I said, as I said, the, there are at this time there are no devices, low-cost devices, uh, using this band. Uh, the 2.4 chip is much cheaper, and there are a lot of additional restrictions in these channels. You need to have dynamic frequency selection, dynamic power control. So these low-cost device manufacturers hesitate to buy this expensive chip. So good luck, good thing they probably stay for a while in the 2.4 band. Uh, yes, so what you can see and how would it look like if you have a pattern which is disturbing you. So as I mentioned, this pattern will have different shapes and let me quickly um, show you what shapes this could be. I have some recorded files here, which I can recall. So this is a typical shape here, which we've seen for a BG channel here. And I show you some other disturbing pattern or disturbing means they are still legal. For example, security camera, which are around a lot. They have a completely different pattern. What you see here again is, coming back to this view, you see here the waterfall, uh, which is actually filling up now. Here you see the waterfall of the whole trace file. So it's actually both. What you see here is just a zoom in. What you see here in that window is just a zoom in of the one here. So what you can do is you can move to a certain specific area, for example here, and then you see these are not Wi-Fi patterns. Absolutely not. These are any kind of modulation, proprietary uh, modulation, which doesn't really care as long as your camera, camera delivers a picture to your monitor. It's absolutely free and it's legal. It's within the power. But don't try to set up a wireless here, right? There is no free channel. If you want to use one, you lost. If you want to use six or 11, so you would have a lot of interference. Doesn't, wouldn't necessarily mean that you couldn't work, but I will show you that the performance would probably be very bad because a lot of packets would be destroyed, they would have to be retransmitted, and this consumes, uh, of course, uh, useless bandwidth. So these are the kind of things you can do. And if you go down here, with the tool, then you see this kind of patterns uh, for specific devices. So you see here the standard B channel pattern, the GN pattern, you see it's a little shape, a little bit different, it's smaller, 20 megahertz, but a little bit more square. You see here channel bonding. These are the normal patterns, but then you have typical patterns pattern of typical uh, disturbances devices. So what you actually can do is you can click on one and try uh, to fit it up here, more or less uh, try to find from the shape, find what possible device uh, it actually is. To be honest, in my experience, I never found a patting pattern to my, to my disturbances, but uh, Maybe in the States they have different shapes than we in Europe. So anyway, it's good for understanding. So here it kind of seems to match Soundcast audio 
uh, audio, it's actually not. It's a video transmitter. Let's try the video transmitter that looks much more smaller. So there are too many devices out there and they all have different uh, pattern. Anyway, it doesn't really, you doesn't really need to know what pattern is. You can easily see this pattern is going to disturb my wireless. And uh, that's good information uh, more uh, than, you, than you need. So let's look at another thing here which uh, comes up. You know, uh, let's have a look forward to later when we talk about AC. AC in wave one allows channel bonding with four channels. And I made a trace file here with an access point which is supporting this. And of course AC only works in the 5 gig band. It's no AC in the 2.4 anymore. So we are in the 5 gig starting with channel 36 here. So you see again here on my waterfall history that uh, I can move up a little bit here. And then you see that I made a download here on four channels. Let's replay this. And you see now the duty cycle is quite high. So there's no much room left here uh, in these cells. The cells are really filled up. And you also see here the sidebands which go down. So uh, if you know about radio frequency, it's very hard to limit the frequency sharply on a certain border. That's almost impossible. It's not required, it just says it must drop by a certain minimum dB and then you can have another channel available over there because you remember the 20 dB uh, difference which is good enough. So you learn a lot about Wi-Fi, uh, uh, about wireless, looking at this uh, stuff here. And uh, you also can verify, of course, your configurations. Uh, it happened more than once to me that we configured a certain device, but we didn't realize that the configuration didn't work active, it did not become active, right? So you may configure four channels, but if you really want sure that four channels are going to be used, that's, that's one way of doing it. Another way is, we will see this later, looking at the speed rate in Wireshark. It will tell you also uh, what speed it is and from the speed you can say how many channels and how many streams must be active. You cannot say how many streams are active in here because the streams just add up in high usage of the channels. So if you want to know how many streams are active, Wireshark comes into play. So this is really nice to see here, this uh, four channel bonding. AC wave two will go up to eight channel bonding. And we only have 19 channel in five gig. So again, roaming will be very difficult because with roaming you try to build up a cell based network which has frequency available, right? And if you're filling up half of the band with one standard, so AC wave two, the focus is for home market. I don't see too much reason to implement it in enterprise. If you have a cell system with at least three or four cells, you're, you're lost anyway. So that's the difficulty with this product. They always aim at two different markets at the home market where you can use the whole bandwidth for, for yourself, right? You don't care what the neighbor has. <laughs> and if you don't care, then you write in your SSID, I'm the king of this network, right? <laughs> Everybody can read your SSID uh, have been misused to uh, send messages to your neighbor, right? <laughs> so, uh, yes. So for the home market, you can use anything you want, right? as long as you don't buy boosters going up to one to meg, uh, one to watt, right? So that's not allowed, but still they are out there. 
but for the enterprise, I don't see more than four channels in a bonded to uh, combined use uh, because then your cell system doesn't work anymore. You have not enough frequency. So that's one common problem we run into this wireless. There are more and more devices in the wireless, but we have very limited channels available. There's, there are a lot of new devices coming out without Ethernet, but there is no single device coming out without wireless. Though they all will, <laughs> at the end, have to use these very limited resources, and it's very hard to find free frequencies around the world. And they go up to 60 megahertz now with the AD standard, right? Uh, that's where it's still free, but 60 megahertz means you cannot leave the room with your signal. So it's a standard. You have to have an access point in every single room. So um, it will be very interesting to see what is coming next here. Any question to this so far? Okay. So that's... Spy, and let's look at one example which fits what we just learned. A large customer called me, told me they have a problem since many weeks, cannot solve it. It's a large logistic company. They unload trains and load trains from trucks to trains and they have two big cranes available here to do the job. And the cranes are manned with a, with a guy sitting here in this part, and he gets this information through wireless, Wi-Fi, normal Wi-Fi, and he has to know which container from which train to which truck, right? But they could not use one of these tracks, uh, one of these cranes, because the wireless kept uh, bra uh, broken, so it uh, didn't work. And actually, it was the crane too here in that corner. The idea was that they both share this uh, railway and work together, but the crane too could only have been used when they moved it to the center when it joined the access point here. They added another access point on this corner. There was already one on the lamp post to cover the outside area. Here it worked perfectly. They added another one here. They had the impression that something is bad in this corner. It didn't help. So they could not use this crane and they called me in. It was a former attendee of one of my classes. And we started analyzing out here. The question is now, do you start with ARP cap or do you start with uh, Y-SPY? My favorite is ARP cap. So because I'm also able to find that we have a problem in layer one, when I use ARP cap, I'll just show you in a minute, I prefer to start with air P cap, but that's uh, up to you how you decide. In this case, I started with air P cap with three of them to cover all the channels at the same time, like I have it here, and we are going to see this later how it works. And we were moving, let's go back, we, are, we have been moving towards this corner here outside. And sorry, and there is one nice thing about wireless, which we are going to cover also. Whenever a wireless packet is sent, it must be acknowledged. If it's not acknowledged, the sender retransmits the packet. We don't have anything like this in layer two of Ethernet, right? Ethernet is a broadcast best effort delivery system. I send out the packet except I have a TCP acknowledge, I will never learn if the packet has arrived. It's different here. Between the access point and the client, every single packet is acknowledged. And this is very valuable for, I'll show you later, is very valuable for 
uh, analyzing. If the packet is not acknowledged, it is retransmitted and it's marked with a retry bit. We are going to see this later, but I just go ahead here. So you have a retry bit in the header. And what I did here, I just made a iograph to show me how many frames have been retransmitted. And you see it was a very high number of percentage with retry bit set. So that indicated that something must be wrong on layer one. Obviously the packets, when they are sent out, are disturbed, interfere with other sources. They have a bad FCS. If they have a bad frame check, they are not acknowledged and so on. So that's what you can see with Wireshark. You cannot tell what it is, but if you have a, an amount of very high percentage, let's say 10% retransmission rate is pretty normal. I will show this later on. So we have up to 10% retransmission rate in a, in a PC wireless is normal. But here we have up, we had up to uh, 50 or more percent and that indicated that something must be wrong on layer one. So then only I changed to YSPY after I've seen this to find out if we can isolate what is wrong. And the customer of course was interested, is it a source on my own campus? Am I responsible for it? Can I remove it? Or is it something from outside my campus? That's what the goal was. So finally, that's what we found. Again, spikes in every band, in, uh, in every channel, in the 2.4 band, but you cannot use any channel. You see it here. And it's very high duty cycle. You see the red? So it's almost constant, constantly sending. By moving out of the campus, we find out it is not coming from the customer itself, which was good for the first moment, but not good if you want to get rid of it, right? Also difficult to tell is, is this still legal? Because if this device is not sending more than 100 milliwatts, there is nothing you can do about it, right? You, ca you just can change channel and go to 5 gig, but you cannot get rid of it. So we find out that it was outside the campus. And let's go back to the picture here. Here we have an official railway line here. So we move towards this railway line and we could say that the signal comes from here because there's also a so-called directional antenna available for Y-SPY or you just can moving by moving seeing the signal getting stronger or not. But we could not go to this public area. You're not allowed to do anything on this railway. So what we had to do, we had to involve the uh, Swiss uh, general uh, our, uh, authority and ask them to measure uh, if this signal is still within range. And that's what they did. They came to a place. They have a similar device uh, like this Y-SPY, uh, probably costs 10 times more, <laughs> but they could confirm that there are these kind of spikes. And they are allowed even to go on any public ground and they, they finally found the source of it. It actually was a, a traffic monitor induction loop from the railway. And of course, this was not the normal function, right? Otherwise, you couldn't use wireless all, the, all the along the railway. No, this device was defect. And it was, uh, you know, if you know about uh, high frequency, uh, there's uh, something like a, a loop. And uh, uh, this device, for whatever reason, was oscillating by defect uh, in, this, in this area and was producing these four spikes. And it was far beyond 100 milliwatt. It was much stronger, right? So uh, that's how we could solve 
this problem. We could not solve it immediately because it takes time, of course. Uh, uh, railways are uh, authorities and uh, everything, so it takes time. But what we did to solve this problem very quickly, actually, we just go back here. We just changed this air, this corner here to 5 gig. Very easy. You have the same SSIDs and you just change the, the frequency on this to 5 gig and the client in, in the crane itself doesn't care because if the client is dual band capable it will find the SSID in the 2.4 or in the 5 gig. So it will roam between the two uh, channels with no problem. So that was a quick um, remedy to solve this problem, make this uh, corner here available. So this is an example how you how you uh, find layer one problems and how they interfere with your Wi-Fi. So again, you will see bad packets. Don't make a filter on FCS frames. FCS bad. Why not? FCS bad means that you capture frames which have a bad frame check sequence. But remember what I said. It may be that on the position you are with your measuring device, you have more FCS error than the actual receiver, right? So you're measuring your bad packets. That's not interesting, right? But if you focus on the retry bit, then you can say that these are real retransmissions and these are real frames which not, have not been acknowledged uh, by the receiver and therefore are sent again. So this is much more valuable, the retry, uh, rather than the FCS. Okay, any more question to this? So again, it could have been any source. It could have, it could have even been uh, something from the campus itself, but they checked it all before. Uh, that's why they, they called me. Otherwise, they probably would have found it uh, themselves. Okay. Let's move on. What other tools beside this Wi-Fi, uh, be, 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 beside this uh, Wi-Spy, do you have available? There are a lot of so-called Wi-Fi scanners out there. They are, they are nice tools, but don't get confused. They are not really scanners. I tell you what they do. For example, I have one here in my Mac uh, available. Uh, it's called Wi-Fi scanner and what it actually does, it's quite valuable. It scans the bands and shows what SSIDs are available and with what strengths and with what encryption and what MAC address, everything available. You have the impression that these are kind of layer one scanner. No, they aren't. We'll see you, uh, show you in a minute. So it shows you all the information what is the SSID, the vendor, uh, channel number, channel bonding, and so on. Uh, also the encryption, WPA, and so on. And the, the data rate, which uh, is available. So here we have uh, 400. Uh, that means we have, must have multiple streams, at, le at least three streams to achieve this uh, throughput. So use this tool. They are available for... Uh, Android and a lot of other tools, but you have to know the limits. These tools are actually working on layer two. And what they do is very easy. They just read the information out of the beacons. The beacons is one of the, uh, is, uh, one of the important uh, control frame, management frame, which we are going to cover. Every access point is sending out uh, 10 beacons per second, roughly, by default. And these beacons contain all the information which you see here. So what these tools do, they just listen to this beacon. And 
read the information from the beacon. But if you have a disturbance on layer one, the beacons would be destroyed. And then these tools would show nothing, right? You see the point? They depend on a working functional layer one. Otherwise, they will not show you anything. Um, you may make a picture, but you get these slides anyway later, so... Uh, <laughs> By the way, where is the shark? Somewhere? Okay. Still alive? <laughs> Virus collection on it now, or what? <laughs> anyway, so these are tools, uh, just a collection. There's one big exception. iOS does not support this kind of tools. So you, there are no legal tools available for iPhones and iPads. And uh, you have to jailbreak if you want to do this. Apple claims that they would like to have control to this layer, right? Uh, yes, they do not allow a tool to access the adapter directly. And that's what you need for, because you need to scan through the channels. And uh, that's not allowed on... Uh, iOS. It used to be, actually, I had an application some years back, but suddenly it didn't work anymore. Obviously, they closed that uh, layer. So these are, most of them are free tools. So use them. They are really nice to have a quick view where is what available. They will not show you duty cycle. They will not be able to tell you which network is free or not because they're just listening to the beacons. And again, if the beacons are not available, here's a screenshot of a beacon which we are going to look at later. The beacon frame sent out every hundred and so millisecond and all the information which these tools show you are available in the beacons. Supported speed, SSID, encryption, country code, and so on. It's nice, but it doesn't help you if layer one is not working. Then you will see nothing with these tools. They will just show blank, a blank, uh, quiet uh, area. Okay. Now let's make next step to layer two and why would you use and should you use RPCAP adapters? Why can I not use my built-in wireless NIC card? Every station, every PC has wireless NIC card. Why not just start Wireshark on this built-in card? You can start it actually. In most cases, it's presented you as an interface, maybe hidden under Microsoft driver or whatever. And you can start Wireshark, and it even shows you frames. But first of all, you will only see your own traffic. I'm talking about Windows now. I'm coming to other operating systems later. First, you will see only your own traffic, no promiscuous mode. Second, these frames are presented as Ethernet frames. They are converted. You see your Ethernet header? That's a fake. We will learn in the next session wireless frames look completely different from Ethernet. The only thing which is common, the MAC address is still 48 bits, right? But the number of fields is very different. In wireless, we will see frames with one MAC, with two MAC, with three MAC, with four MAC addresses. And that's why this is not the real thing. S third thing, first is your own traffic. Second, wrong frames. Third thing, you will only see frames if you are connected. So you will not see any control and management frames, like beacons, probe requests, and all this stuff. You won't see them, because a normal these normal adapters do not forward them to the application. Normal application would not use it. So this is a real restrictions, restriction. For analyzing, I would say useless. Because when, I, when you have data frame in the air, normally you have the problem solved. 
The problem is before you can send data, all the authentication and probe request process which we are going to look at. So whenever, whenever you are in the state of sending data, then you're probably on the safe side. Of course, you still can have throughput performance and things like this. So it does not really help to use the internal adapter. Exception are some other operating system. For example, Mac OS. So if I go to the Mac OS here, I uh, close down the scanner and start my Wireshark here. I have uh, windows here on uh, VM Fusion in a virtual environment, so I still have native Mac down here. And I can start Wireshark here. And if I go to the interfaces here, then you can see that you have what is called a monitor mode. So you can switch to a monitor mode here. And then if you start this Wi-Fi, it will actually show you, okay, it will actually show you, okay, the wrong, I have the wrong encapsulation here, okay, yes. And now it will actually show you here beacon frames and all the control frames which we are going to quickly cover. Acknowledges, probe requests, requests to send, clear to send, you see this? These are frames which are only in the air. They are never on the wire. You won't see them behind the access point. They are used to control the connection in the air, in the cell. And every cell has its own. So. These are the ones which uh, we are going to use for troubleshooting. So uh, if you have a Mac or whatever, they can show you this. But this is limited to one channel, right? The channel which you are associated. We will see later that if you want to analyze roaming problem, one channel is not good enough. And that's why you may need more than one adapter, like I have it here. And you can tune then these adapters to different channels and can capture simultaneously in different channels into the same trace file, by the way. So you don't have to merge, merge anything. Um, that's, that's done by uh, uh, Wireshark. Again, it's not really affordable for private use, uh, these adapters from uh, Riverbed initially from case invented, but for commercial uh, use, enterprise use, it's uh, in a reasonable range. They are about, I think, $700 each or so, one uh, device, and uh, yes. Again, what I normally do, I go out with at least three of them, and they allow also uh, channel bonding. They support D11N standard at the moment, and they allow you to look at different uh, channels. And uh, uh, again, if you have roaming problem, if you want to analyze roaming problem, then you have to look at different channels. I'll show you later on uh, how this is uh, going to work. Yes, that's what is available now. We wait for an adapter supporting more channels and supporting more streams. I didn't hear any official announcement yet, so we are a little bit stuck here with 11N. But I show you it's not helpless, because even if you have bonded of uh, three or more channel, the important information is all the control and management frames, which are important, they always are only sent in the base channel. They are not spread over the channels. So even if you have only one channel or two with NX, the data may be sent over four channels, but the acknowledge coming back will be in the base channel. So if you see, you won't see the data, but you would see the acknowledge, right? So you're not blind. <laughs> you still can see, but 
you won't see the data. Anyway, the data in many cases would be encrypted. So it's anyway useless, but you would see the frame, of course. But I'm going to talk about encryption. If you have pre-shared key, uh, then you will be able to uh, decrypt if you have the key available. Uh, I'm going to look at this. Yes, let's power up here these adapters. And see how we can configure them. So let's close this channel here. Actually, these adapters consume quite a bit of power. Each adapter, each single adapter consumes 250 milliampere. A normal USB port provides you with only 500. So you would mean that you should not connect more than two of them. But I find out it works in many cases, but it draws quite some power from your PC, right? And if you're going out for roaming analyzing, you may need your, your uh, uh, battery for the PC. So what I did, I normally have this kind of uh, power uh, bank with me. On here, I can even read uh, what the uh, amp, what uh, amps are consumed, and it's uh, quite precise. It's 730 milliampere with the three adapters. So, and this uh, will last for a few hours here. This battery pack, so I can save my uh, built-in battery because I have to run Wireshark and, and, and other tools and. Uh, available. So this is my recommendation if you if you have um, analyzing for long. I even I even have cut off the power from this USB connector here to the PC. If you look at the USB connector it has four pins right and the outer two are for power. So if you cut this then you don't draw power from your PC anymore, because the, the center two are for signaling and the outer two for power. So I'm sure this configuration here will not draw any power from my PC because I have removed the pins here. I fully um, power this from my bank here. Okay. So first of all, you have to install uh, the RPCAP driver, which is available on Riverbed website. And then you should start your Wireshark. Uh, first problem is you have frequently you have to start it in admin no mode in order to recognize your adapter. So remember this if it runs and starts up and if you don't see your RPCAP uh, try in, pow uh, in admin mode. So now what you see here are the three adapters. 0, 1 and 2. And you see a virtual adapter called multi-channel. This one is created as soon as you have more than one adapter. So if you only have one then you would only see the 0. As soon as you insert another one this one is created. And this is actually the one you are going to select if you would like to aggregate uh, the information from all three adapters. So you just double click on that one like an interface and you start the... Okay, I missed it. I took the zero 01 here. That was the wrong one. So let's try again. And Go to the channel adapter. Okay. And yes, I have to configure something here so that we see the color first. Anyway, we have these adapters available. That's the first step. The adapters should be visible on your Y on your uh, Wireshark, otherwise 
the driver is not properly installed. The next thing is you are going to configure these adapters. And there's a special panel here and it will be only visible let me close here some of these windows. There's a special panel which comes up, a toolbar, which comes up if you go to view wireless toolbar. So this is a toolbar specially, speci uh, specifically for RP caps. And here you see a tab RP, control, RP cap control panel. You also will have this, you will also have this available down here under RP cap control panel as soon as you install uh, the RP cap driver. And what you actually have to do is here you have to con configure each adapter and its appropriate channel. So here you can look which one is the one you're configuring. The adapter null zero uh, is now in channel one. The adapter one is in cha channel one and the adapter two is in channel six. So I'm going to capture one, six and eleven. I also of course could go up to five gig because the NX support five gig. So I could say give me channel 30 6, 40, and 46, uh, 44. Remember the four channel difference. I also normally concentrate on valid frames. I'm not really interested in bad frames. Uh, you always have bad frames, and they just fill up your lines. But as I said, uh, some of them are not really bad frames arrived at the receiving end. They are bad frames because of your position. So I'm not interested in this one. The second thing we are going to talk about is the capture type. The PPI, radio tap, or 802.11 only. I recommend PPI for the NX adapter and we are going to look at this in a minute. Also, the, and this is keeps, people keep forgetting this, also you have to configure some parameters on the multi-channel aggregator. Of course, not the channels, the channels are configured on the individual adapters, but for example, the capture type should be the same here, and also the frame you would like to look at should be the frame. Now one thing, if you try to do OK and you have your Wireshark open in the background, it won't work. OK, <laughs> it did work. <laughs> Let me try again. OK. There used to be an error message sometimes. OK. Let me check if it accepted what I did. Yes, it did. I found out sometimes I had an error message, then I had to close Wireshark first before these values uh, are accepted. But at the moment, it does not seem to have any problem. So let's start now. Wireshark again. OK. Yes. Here we go. If I click now to do this multi-channel, I would see packets from all channel in this room. So this is live. I have coloring rules for every channel, but I also have the channel number in here. And I show you then this information is from this PPI header, which we are going to talk about. 
you don't have the channel number in normal frames. The channel number is only present in very little frames, for example, the beacons. But you are interested in any other frames. So that's why this PPI information is valuable and this information is added. Remember, it's not part of the transmitted packet. It's something which is added by this RPCAP at reception, like metadata, data about data. Again, the speed. You won't see a speed indicator in the packets, but it's important whether a, a packet is transmitted at 1 meg or at 24, right? Because at 1 meg means it consumes longer time on that cell. The cell is blocked during that transmission. And here you see uh, in different colors I'm going to talk about this uh, simultaneous measurement. Okay, so here it's explained in detail. This radio tap or PPI. Why do we have two headers? The reason is the radio tap header is the old format for the RPCAP Classic. And for the NX, like we have it here, adapter, you're using the PPI. It's actually the same concept. The idea is adding information from layer 1 into the stored trace file. So you can use this information to add columns, to define your position, and all the things which we are going to see, to see signal-to-noise ratio, and so on. So very valuable. And here are the two different headers. You have to configure it. You, you remember which header type you want. Again, radio tap header used by the RPCAP Classic. The, that's the older one, which supports only 2.4. Let me go back, sorry. And the PPI for uh, the RPCAP uh, NX. Again, these are actually data which are here in the packet. So they are stored with the packet. But we are talking about the pseudo header because they never were in the air like this. And that's really nice for troubleshooting uh, these important fields. And I quickly can make open up a trace file now from the one uh, you have also copied and see what this information can do for you. So for example we have here a beacon uh, 11 AC and let me increase the font size a little bit and let me adjust and you see here if I go to the header you see the, th the 32 bytes marked down here and this information is available now for doing columns, additional columns and so on. You see the noise minus 90 that's a good value the signal that's very good value, minus 20. So we have actually 70 dB difference. We, 20 dB will be good enough. OK, we are going to use this for columns. That's the purpose. I mentioned it. You are going to add columns and make a wireless profile. That's the profile you have with you right? on, the, on the shark which you copy. It has already included these values. And always keep an eye on these values. And you see a lot, if you see a lot of frames with low speed, then the throughput of your cell is down, right? It, it could be 54, but if people, if stations are at the end of the cell, they are descending with 6 meg. And then they are consuming bandwidth. And that's why this information is very important here, all these fields uh, we are going to see uh, on the next. Yes, coloring rules are also added. We are 
able to add a different rule per channel, which makes it very visible. For example, here you see a device sending probe requests through all the channels. That's the first thing you ever see when you turn on a Wi-Fi. It's going through all the channels, looking for access points by sending probe requests. And if you have three, uh, three uh, RP cap, then you will see the station scanning through the channel, so 11, 6 and 1 here, and then it starts again. Of course, it scans also the channel in between, but I didn't capture this one, but uh, you can assume it's all, they are also scanning. Who works with profiles already? Wireshark profiles, okay. Who used profile before version 2.2? Okay, you will have a problem with this profile. There is a small little bug. Uh, you would not be able to change color on an older, on an older profile. Uh, it took me quite some time uh, to find out and that's why I would like to uh, save you that time. So um, I quickly show you, I modified this pro these profiles, the one you have already, but if I go to any of my old profile, for example, voice over IP here, and if I would like to change a color, uh, then I go to view, go to coloring rules, and if I try to just change anything, I don't even have to change anything. By just pressing OK, you get an error message that your coloring rule uh, contains unknown uh, rules and you will not be able to change anything on this. It's a very new bug, Cheryl has confirmed uh, they are working on it. I show you a quick workaround. The problem is the rule here. Checksum, they, they redefined these fields and you cannot remove it even if you want you cannot remove it, it will not accept, it will delete it but if you want to store, you will have the same message. So what you actually do have to do is you have to go to the profile and to the, to the file color filter and remove this line with an edit text editor. So remove this line and then uh, it will only come up. So that's uh, something which may save you some time. The problem is once you have used another profile, it will not work on the profile which you have corrected already. And that's ugly. So <laughs> if I try to do changes now on a profile which I removed, you see, I removed it here, it will have the same effect. It will come up with the same message. So you have to restart it via Shark in order to make it uh, work. So just for those who have old um, uh, trace files, uh, old uh, profiles and try. The coloring rule will still work. That's okay. The whole profile will work, but it will not be able to do any changes on it. That's that's the limitation. Okay. Great. So we are running out of time. Let's have a look forward. Cliffhanger to next session. This is what we are going to cover. We are focusing on layer two now. We are going to understand what are these frames for. As I said, these are the frames you need to understand for troubleshooting. If you understand the processes these packets are involved, then you will be able to assign the problem to either the client or to the uh, access point or to the air or, or whatever. What else? Okay, thank you very much for uh, joining. Uh, please fill in these uh, evals on the, on the uh, web application and hope to see you back after the break. Thank you.